Um, the reading from today, the reading for today is from Judges 3, verses 12 to 30. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Then he gathered to himself the people of Ammon and Amalek, and went and defeated Israel, and took possession of the city of Palms. So the children of Israel served Eglon, king of Moab, 18 years. But when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for them, Ehud, the son of Gerar, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. By him the king of, children of Israel sent tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Ehud made himself a dagger. It was double-edged and a cubit in length and fastened it under his clothes on his right thigh. So he brought tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man, and when he had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who had carried the tribute. But he himself turned back from the stone images that were at Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. He said, keep silence. And all who attended him went out from him. So Ehud came to him. Now he was sitting upstairs in his cool private chamber. Then Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. So he arose from his seat. Then Ehud reached with his left hand, took the dagger from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. Even the hilt went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not draw the dagger out of his belly, and his entrails came out. Then Ehud went out through the porch and shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked them. When he had gone out, Eglon's servants came to look, and to their surprise, the doors of the upper room were locked. So they said, he's probably attending to his needs in the cool chamber. So they waited till they were embarrassed, and still he had not opened the doors of the upper room. Therefore they took the key and opened them, and there was their master, fallen dead on the floor. But Ehud had escaped while they delayed, and passed beyond the stone images, and escaped to Seira. And it happened when he arrived, that he blew the trumpet in the mountains of Ephraim, and the children of Israel went down with him from the mountains, and he led them. Then he said to him, to them, Follow me, for the Lord has delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him, seized the fords of the Jordan leading to Moab, and did not allow anyone to cross over. And at that time they killed about 10,000 men of Moab, all stout men of valor, not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel. And the land had rest for 80 years. These are the words of the Lord. Oh, feeling really encouraging. Thank you, guys. (laughs) And having someone to read a passage before the sermon has actually reminded me of the faith tradition I grew up with. And making me ready and getting exciting about sharing the word of God, the written word, scripture. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, we hope that today you will encounter the living word of God, Jesus. And today, as we continue a series of Help of Faith, which I have a privilege to introduce one of the least well-known heroes of faith, Ehud. And this is probably not suitable for Sunday story. So here's the disclaimer. If you are under 13, make sure your parents are close with you. Otherwise, just simply cover your eyes as we unfold the detail of the story. <laughs> so here we go. Let's begin. Good morning. My name is Ming. I was born and raised in this island called Taiwan. A beautiful island, actually. And now I'm here serving in the Chinese, uh, Chinese ministry at Great City also pursuing my degree in theology through uh, Cary Baptist College. During my time of study, I often joke about my identity as an Asian. 
I'm not Bijan, nor Cijan, but Asian. Therefore, I was only accepting my A grades. Although studying a second language is already really hard and confusing sometimes. But here's a few questions I constantly asking myself. Like, am I really able to study here? Do I deserve the grade I get? Or even, how can I serve God and have so many problems and issues that need to be dealt with? To sum it up, in many circumstances, I felt like I'm a fraud or imposter. Have you ever felt like that before? Drowning in a sense of self-doubt that I might be not good enough, an overwhelming fear of being exposed as inadequate. If people around know the real me, maybe that no one will stay and love me. And my hunch is that I'm not the only one who experienced this from time to time. In fact, the story of Ehud in the book of Judges might actually shed light as the antidote of our imposter syndrome. And before we unfold the story of Ehud, it will be great and spend some time to understand the context of the text. So chapter 3, verse 12, it says, Again, the Israelites do evil in the eyes of the Lord. And because they, have, they did evil, the Lord gave Eglon, king of Moab, power over Israel. The word again here, revealing a pattern in the story, is a downward spiral of sin, cycle of sin, which I'll describe as 3D cycle. Each of them describes the circumstance of the Israelites at times, but it also provides a potential lesson of faith that we can take away with. So this cycle was first introduced in earlier chapter, chapter 2, verse 10 to 19. So then the, Lord, then the people of Israel sing against the Lord and began to serve the bowels. They stopped worshiping the Lord, the God of their ancestor, the God who had brought them out of Egypt, and they began to worship other gods, the gods of the people around them. They bowed down to them and made the Lord angry. So the first D is disobedience. Instead of being a blessing to the world by being the people of the covenant Yahweh decided to be through living differently to the people around them. The Israelites, they forgotten or forsaken their identity as people of God. Their enemy, their enemy used to conquer become their conqueror. The same oppression their father Papa have endured. Now it's not a once upon a time story, but an everyday reality they live in because they disobey the law and their Lord. However, in God's relentless love and mercy, there's always hope in the midst. So the first lesson of faith here, we can see later in uh, Ehud's story, is this. Faith is about obedience to God. Faith is about obedience to God. In my years in New Zealand, I learned this English phrase, action, speak louder than words. And I found it really powerful. As we having faith in God, we will follow His footsteps and follow His commands. As we have faith in God, that He will call us out to tangible action of living differently. For example, we might be called out of our comfort zone to serve the people and to love the unlovable one. Or giving our time, our resources to the one who needed the most sacrificially. And there's so much more. And the second reading in this, uh, this the cycle is this discipline. They stopped worshiping the Lord and served the bells and asterisks. And so let the Lord become furious with Israel and dead riders attack and rob them. He dead the enemy, overwhelm, overpower them. And the Israelites no longer protect themselves. Every time they were going to battle, the Lord was against them, just as he said he would be. They were in great distress. So the second deal in the cycle is about this discipline. In the book of Joshua, which is a previous book in the canon, the Israelites was an instrument that God used to bring judgment or discipline to the, to the sins of the Canaanites. Ironically, it is the other way around in the story of Judges. The pagan nation now becoming the instrument of God to discipline his own people for the original reader. They will instantly take them back to the scene of Deuteronomy, where Yahweh declared blessing and curse. I have brought you today to the crossroad of blessing and curse. The blessing, 
If you listen obediently to the commandments of God, your God, which I command you today, the curse, if you don't pay attention to the commandments of God, your God, but leave the road I command you today, follow other gods of which you know nothing. This passage clearly states that it is not that God having a bad day, so he decides to let his people suffering, that them, that them failing plan, because he wants to and he can. Israel's suffering was primarily directing to their own idolatry and unfaithfulness to the covenant and to their Lord. But even in this suffering was painful and their fault to blame, Yahweh is still working and calling them to come back to repent. So here's the second lesson of faith in this story. Faith is a courageous move to come back to God. Faith is a courageous move to come back to God. In the moments of persecution or hardship, Faith serves as a guiding light, urging us to come back to God. It's an invitation to acknowledge our foes, to seek forgiveness, to reestablish our connection with the Holy One. Despite the consequence of our action, faith assures that God will, will welcome us with open arms, offer redemption and renewal. In a time of wandering, faith calls us to return to the source of grace and mercy, fostering this renewal relationship with the Almighty. And the third thing in the story is deliverance. Then the Lord gave the Israelites leaders who saved them from their riders. But the Israelites paid no attention to their leaders. Israel was unfaithful to the Lord and worshiped other gods. Their father have obeyed the Lord's command, but this new generation soon stopped doing so. Whenever the Lord gave Israel a leader, the Lord will help that leader and will save the people from their enemies as long as the leaders live. The Lord was have mercy on them because they groaned under their suffering and oppression. But when the leader died, the people will return to their old ways and even behave, behave worse than the previous generation. They will serve and worship other gods and stubbornly continue their own evil ways. So this third day is about deliverance. Nevertheless, the Exodus experience to shape their unique identity as the chosen people of God through the covenantal relationship with Yahweh. They hold on to this divine revelation in Exodus 34, a compassionate, gracious God, slow to anger and full of mercy and love. Therefore, the third lesson we can take away today is this. The faithfulness of Yahweh is the foundation of our faith. The faithfulness of Yahweh is the foundation of our faith. In the time of Judges, Yahweh will listen to the cry of the people, not because they are worthy, worthy, but because of his nature of loving. And indeed, that he can make miracles through the imperfect, even faulty peop- uh, people, like some of the Judges, Gideon, Jephthah, and Samson, etc. So suppose the book of Joshua is about the victory of the covenant fulfilled as a people entering to the promised land. In this case, the story in Judges is about human failure to keep the promise and ultimately showing our inability to keep the covenant with our own strength. So I often wonder, can you think of the moment in your life where you resonate with the cycle? I often wonder, maybe you are in the stage of disobedience. Deep down, you know that your suffering is because of your sin or hypocrisy. Maybe you are experiencing the transformation of power of the gospel, yet still wondering, when will I be good enough? Maybe you feel like you're living in the prison of past hurt or what people say about you, and you're knowing that freedom or liberation, yet you're thinking that you're not, you may be not worthy. As I prepare this message, I pray that story of Ehud will bring challenge, also encouragement to our journey. So here's the key insight I want you to take away today. God used the improbable to accomplish the impossible. God used the improbable to accomplish the impossible. So in chapter 3, verse 15 and 17, it says, Again, the Israelites cry out to the Lord, and he gave them a deliverer, Ehud, a left-handed man, the son of Jerah, Benjamin. He presented tribute to Eglon, king of Moab, who was a very fat man. 
Bible usually didn't give us the description of one's appearance, but when they do, we should pay extra attention to the details to see what they're trying to convey. Our protagonist, Ehud, in the story, is a left-handed man from a tribe of Benjamin, which literally translates son of my right hand. In the ancient Hebrew world, it could mean that either Ehud is a handicap on his strong arm, which is usually the right hand, or he was born with using his left hand more naturally. Whatever it is, this is a critical information that we have for Ehud. And the author in the Bible didn't give us any details of his life as a lefty in the tribe of right hand. But I don't think it's too far to assume that he might as well have been looking down by his own people, his own clan, the son of the right hand tribe, because of his difference. Yet we will see how this weird, but, but the special inconvenience of being a lefty will contribute to God's saving plan of the nation. I also share the same privilege as being born as a left hand like Ehud. And I know historically, in many cultures in Africa or, or Asia, generally speaking, they have a negative impression toward left handedness. I can still remember the time when my mom tried to tie out my hand because he found out I'm starting to use my left hand more. Otherwise, I have to redo my homework because the order of my writing wasn't the right way. Anyway, some of them might even go through a correction process to train to use their right hand so they can be accepted by the society. King Eglon from Moab, on the other side, our antagonists of the story, probably have extraordinary diplomatic skill when it comes to allying Ammonites and Amalekites and Moabites against the Israelites. Yet, he's not usually a usual warrior type of king that ancient, ancient world will expect. But still, the Israelites have no hope defeating them through merely military action. They need is a miracle. I love the description in verse 18, 19, when Ehud chose to execute a plan on his own. The first possible interpretation could be he did not want many people to know to reduce the risk of being found out. However, the second one I found it more convi- uh, convincing is that because he tried to, this is a strategy that Ehu employed to deceive the enemy, to get their guard down and create the op- unique opportunity that he needs for the mission to success. However, the plot is now this quest of impossible mission of taking down Eklom is now laid on the improbable person, Ehu, a lefty from the right hand tribe. I often wonder, did Ehu ever doubt himself, like me? Or many other people sitting down here today, is this going to work? Can't be the right person for this important job. This type of fear will paralyze us into doubt. And for Christians, we are not immune from this. It might look like we are asking questions. Do I deserve God's love and mercy? Am I living up to the Christian standard? What if others discover I'm not a real Christian? Can I make a difference in the world? Or why are the things so spiritual? However, Ehu, the hero of faith in the story, have conquered that fear. In verse 20 to 23, we are entering the climax of the narrative, which is Ehu's assassination of Eglon, which is vividly described in the text. So it's starting like this. Starting with approaching the king under the guise of delivering a divine message, Ehu finally waits for the perfect opportunity when Eglon was all alone with him. And with courage and precision, Ehu declared a divine mission, prompting the king to rise up from the sea. In the moment of swift and unexpected action, Ehu drew the sword from his right thigh with his left hand and plunged it into the king's belly. And what was inside the king have now come out disgracefully. There are many different translations of the graphic detail of this action, such as fat, balls, or even poo-poo, which paint a powerful image of violence in this encounter. Eglon not only died, the disgusting description of this uh, act adding this ill and distressing element into the narrative. And I guess this is why this story wasn't adding to the Sunday school as I grew up. Although God sings behind the scene in the narrative, he's actually the director who orchestrated the success of this plot carried out by Ehud. 
this assassination show that God can and indeed use imperfect people like Ehud, turning the act of terrorism or even to a degree a suicidal attack into the pivot of the salvation of the nation. Now the impossible mission of liberation has been shaken through the improbable person, Ehud. But still, the story didn't end with the success of this, this uh, assassination. If the success of the plot didn't surprise you, the fact that Ehu can get away should make you tick. Again, the great act of faith can only possibly be explained by this God's sovereign providence, or more bluntly, God was in it. In many other Old Testament narratives, God had used many improbable persons to achieve his impossible mission. Ehu was one of them, and in fact, he was far better than many other well-known characters. If you have suffered in fear and still living in doubt, I will propose that faith in God is our antidote to our imposter syndrome. So if you look at the screen here, all those people you might heard heard in the story, Abraham, Jacob, David, Saul, Moses, Peter, all those imperfect or improbable men was used by God to accomplish impossible mission. So if you ever wonder if God can use ordinary people like you and me, that he not only can minister through, but he loves to work through us. The phrase in verse 27 say, blow the trumpet, which is a common biblical expression conveying a message, a warning, assembly, religious significance, or the acknowledgement of God's presence and intervention. Just like the wall of Jericho fell down, as Joshua followed the commands by blowing the, the ram horn, now Ehu, after successfully canceling the oppressive Moabite rulers, blow the trumpet to signal the turning point for the Israelites, and noting that because what had been done for them, now the people they are able to fight the battle against their enemy. So the story ends with Israel's victory over the Moabites through the deliverance of Yahweh by the leadership of Ehu, and his success become the victory of the Hebrew people. But suppose we follow the narrative forward in Judges. After Ehu, there are judges like Gideon, good and bad, Jephthah, pretty bad, and one of the most well-known ones, Samson. Indeed, that we are still in the cycle of downward spiral of sin, which is the whole Old Testament story can be summarized as a failure of humanity to be the faithful partner of the covenant. Until the true improbable person came. The word became flesh. The one who was pierced with a spear died on the cross for his people. The one who defeated the power of sin and death by raising from the grave. The one who is conditioned to a human body to reveal the unconditional love of Yahweh. The impossible mission of reconciliation, of redemption and restoration now lay on the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He represents human, humanity like Ehud did for his people, yet choose the way of sacrifice instead of violence. He not only, he not only escaped the the sting of death like Ehu escaped after the plot. But his victory of resurrection is sheer with whoever put their trust in him. He said, follow me, like Ehu did, not to a warrior, but to the marginalized in the society. So the new community of faith now formed. If the Ehu story tells us God can accomplish the impossible thing through the improbable, then through Jesus, the ultimate impossible mission is now complete through incarnate presence of Jesus Christ. And to finish today, I want to share one verse in the Bible. You probably hear this a million times, but I just want to bring that again. For nothing will be impossible with God. For nothing will be impossible in God, with God. The verse in Luke chapter 1, verse 37, encourage me when I start doubt, uh, drowning in doubt and fear. And because of Jesus, now I can walk in faith with the one who is faithful. Would you put your trust 
to this improbable yet real person of Jesus today and share the impossible victory that he has won for us. And let us pray, entering my favorite time of our gathering, which is a communion. And communion is a reminder for the Christian people what God has done for us. But it's also, for me, an invitation for whoever wanting to encounter Jesus. Jesus said, come, let me do life with you. Come, let me be with you. And it's a beautiful thing that as Grace City, as a church, as a new people of faith, that we can do this together week in, week out. This is the table of grace. Whatever doubt, whatever fear you're holding, come to the table and then take Jesus' uh, Jesus' body and Jesus' blood and exchange that with him. He would love to take the burden that you are carrying because he loved us so much. He died and rise for us. So this is a mystery, wonderful mystery we can endure together as a new people of faith. So I'll pray. And then in your time, I invite you to bring whatever in your heart. Maybe you are thinking, you are in, you're being through an impossible situation. You don't see hope. Maybe you are living in the darkness that you don't see lights. But come to Jesus. Come to the table of grace. He surely wants to meet you there. Let us pray. Jesus, our real deliverer, we praise you. Thank you for what you have done 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem. And we thank you for what you continue doing in the right hand of the Father. You're still praying for us. So we come today, whatever fear, whatever doubt that we have, Lord, we give it to you. In exchange, that your love, your hope, your peace, filled us through your spirit. So we come to the table today. Remind me of who you are and what you have done for us so we can face the battle in our life. Thank you, Jesus, that we know that we are not alone, that you're here with us and we have one another. So Jesus, we pray in this communion time, uh, communion time that you'll meet us and show us who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.